we've been out and seen this. Oh my God, we need tomorrow to do the meeting on this. Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to really think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again. Lloyd Williams Jones. Hello there. And Shannon Doherty. Hi. And together, we're going to explore teacher development. But first, Chris, what's she reading for? Hey, what are you reading for? This week, I have been reading, I finally finished actually, uh, a book called An Intro- Introduction to English Morphology by Andrew Carstairs McCarthy. Got it just, got it just here. Um, but one in a series of introductions to aspects of linguistics, mainly because whenever I learn a bit more about our spelling system, well, our, our writing system, our conventions of our writing system, so our orthography in, uh, in effect, what I find is that people say, yep, to really understand this, you have to have a, a really good grasp of morphology. And realistically, my grasp of morphology before reading this book was okay, I like to think, but not, um, not vast. And this book, I like to think, has started me on a journey towards understanding it better. It's really, really fascinating. It sounds very niche, but actually it's just an introduction to the way that our written language conveys meaning, how that interacts with uh, phonology, so how that interacts with sound, um, how that interacts with the history of our language, so it's, its etymology. It's, yeah, it was actually a really, really engaging and interesting read. One of these books that's got lots of little... Um, tasks along the way that you can complete which I find really useful for learning so yeah highly recommended if you are interested in this particular aspect of of linguistics what about you Shannon what are you reading for I am currently and sort of just always reading walkthroughs and at the moment I'm delving into walkthroughs three which came out last month at some point Um, and sort of just getting to grips with all the different strategies in there. They've got different things like uh, cold call variations, which is particularly interesting. I do, we do, you do. Um, Lots of nice little kind of strategies that people can get their their mitts on. What about you, Lloyd? What are you reading for? Uh, I've been reading primary, huh? Is that how you say it? I don't know, like, like, is it primary, huh? Or is it primary, huh? Like, I, I don't know, like, I feel like there's an inflection somewhere there. And I feel like if, if you say it in one way, it could really get, like, misconstrued. Anyway, I'm reading Primary Care. And I particularly have honed in as we are developing our art curriculum currently with my art lead uh, and an external specialist. Sophie Merrill's chapter on, um, on art. And it's, it's rather good. It's rather good. And she really knows her onions about, about art and the teaching of primary art for a particularly lay person, me picking that book up. It was excellent. Really thought, uh, carefully thought out sequencing, how things are revisited in art all the way through. She spoke about artists and a real, real meaningful links between artists and units and not just, and, and actually encountering artists again uh, in do, doing different forms of work. So like challenging the perception of the artist the second time around, getting children really smart, really, really smart. Sophie is, uh, is, is, is excellent at the, in that. So I would highly recommend uh, reading her chapter in primary. Huh? Kieran, what you reading for? Thanks, Lloyd. I'm reading something by Brody, Clements and Sarama. And it's called Lessons Learned from 10 Experiments that Tested the Efficacy and assumptions of hypothetical learning trajectories. And I think this was released in March or published in March. And I think there it's almost like a revisit to learning trajectories and where we are, you know, an extended period of time, you know, after the, the publication and the, the sort of development of those resources and things, you know. So 
Yeah, really interesting read. I can't remember exactly what triggered me to think that there was something published recently, but um, I typed into Scholar, and actually they've been quite prolific in 2022. So anyone who's big into Clements and Sarama, definitely go and uh, check out Google Scholar. So this week, we're going to explore teacher development on quite a big scale. And it was inspired by a talk that Shannon gave at Research Ed Berkshire. And Shannon was given the chance to come up with the questions that would guide this. But she didn't give me any. So I went to people who were at the talk and she only has herself to blame for the questions that she gets asked tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to drag the first one to you, Shannon. So in the past, you know, particularly at Research Head Berkshire, you have described the need to move away from archaic staff meeting structures. And I know you've done this too, Lloyd. What is it that makes them archaic? And how might we make this move in our own schools? Right. So I think... People might listen and might be slightly offended by the word archaic because it's probably similar to what is happening in their schools. I think the main thing for me is that sort of week one, the staff meeting is maths, week two, it's science, week three, phonics, week four might be SCND, week five might be something ridiculous like organizing sports day. And there's no running thread, there's no revisiting anything. It's sort of like, bam there's some information go and implement it no sort of coming back on that and seeing how it's going there's you know I, it sounds really harsh but no sort of central joined up thinking SLT might be unaware of what's coming they might have spoken to the people delivering that that training so they don't know what's coming they might not stick around for it if they're not doing it professional development just doesn't seem to be a priority and um I just think it we know better now so that's probably that's why you know I call them archaic staff meetings and I think instead there should be a, a well thought out joined up CPD plan not just a schedule of staff meetings that you know just so everyone knows what week is their week but a real plan that meets the needs of the school and you know you might be focusing on on one thing for a half term or a term but what that looks like in different subjects, what that looks like in different year groups, you know, uh, variations of it. You, you know, you might be looking at questioning or specifically cold calling, and that could take a long time. It might be retrieval and looking at different ways of, of kind of weaving that into your teaching, but really going in and focusing to improve practice rather than sort of ticking a box and saying, well, I've done a staff meeting on maths now, so I don't have another one for a term. And I think, we think about CPD, we, we use the acronym CPD constantly, and the C is about continued learning and learning over time, and not just one-offs, but we seem to have a model of just one-off staff meetings that don't seem to have much of an impact on practice and improving outcomes for our pupils. I don't know what anyone else thinks. That sounds an awful lot like the professional development that I experienced for most of my career. It was mostly turn up one, as you say, turn up one week, we're going to look at history this week. Um, I even remember being kind of on the other end of that, being a subject leader, being asked to say, look, in the fourth week of, you know, half term five, I'd like you to do something on science. And you think, well, how is this? Is this part of a joined up plan? What, how do I actually make this? purposeful useful what is it that you have identified or even better what if have I told you as a senior leader what I've identified that I think teachers need to work on in terms of their science no not really it's just it's your turn do this thing so I think that's a really common structure I'm not suggesting that there are that this is the way that loads of schools are doing things though actually no I am this is the way that's as far as I can tell that loads of schools are doing things still but there are there are plenty of schools that have moved away from this that are doing things in a more thoughtful manner but if I had to guess from discussions with members of the family who are in uh, teaching loads of ex-colleagues things I see on Facebook and on Twitter I would still say that this is probably the norm it's the most common way 
of doing things. I totally agree with the idea that you need a long-term plan. And I, you can see how this is anathema to certain people that they're so used to something else. At my last school, we did um, maths, um, work on maths pedagogy, maths subject knowledge, um, and pedagogical content knowledge is so obviously kind of the overlap between those two. And we did that for a couple of half terms. Yes, we embedded other things related to formative assessment and planning through, through that. But people were saying to me, what, still maths, even after three weeks, three weeks of focusing on mathematics. Like, yeah, this is a, this is a school priority. This is something we've decided really needs work. If you think if you think three weeks is going to cover it, then you wait till you see we're, we're going for a couple of a term at least. And at first there was some sense of um, surprise about that. But I, I like to think that over time teachers began to sense that there was something more purposeful about there being a longer priority alongside other bits and pieces that we might I'm sure we'll talk about later, you know, relating to individual teacher priorities, but having this wider view of what the school wants to achieve and targeting it over a longer period of time is certainly um, essential. I think one of the other things to, to sort of consider and think about uh, is, yes, that I know when we're talking about archaic kind of structures, yeah, the maths happens tomorrow, the, you know, and all being mapped out and laid in, ready to go. But also, I think an archaic structure is, we've been out and seen this. Oh my God, we need tomorrow to do the meeting on this. And the poor subject leader is shoved out of class to, to emergency put a Band-Aid on something that probably is a big whole school priority. Uh, so there's that side of our, uh, when, when we consider uh, archaic structures as well. And, and, I, and I do think you need, we need to be very careful uh, of how we define knee-jerk versus responsive because i think there's a place for responsive uh but i also think that can that can really sort of blur the lines between those two things and i think when you think of responsive is it responsive to last year is it responsive to last term is it responsive to last week you know think of responsive on 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 those different stages um because responding isn't a bad thing responding like tomorrow might be a bad thing for that leader because like you might overwhelm them. You may, you know, that's the sort of thing that can tip a middle leader over the edge and go, I'm not doing this anymore. This is wild. You know, you've just put an insane amount of pressure on me because that's the, the local authority are coming in tomorrow to look at next week to look at X, Y, and Z and it isn't fixed and da, 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 da. And we've got to be brave as leaders to go, well, okay, it's not fixed, but we're going to sit down, we're going to map something out, we're going to work, and we're going to, and we're going to make sure that we, when they come in, we go, yeah, it's not right, but this is what we're doing, and this is why we're doing it, and this is where we're going. And I think that thinking uh, is, is definitely cascading down, I'm sure Shannon will agree, is cascading down in, in the national professional qualifications that, that are currently on offer to people. And I, I just do think we need to just think carefully about that. And Chris, just to, to tap onto your point there, you, you just probed into that bigger question there about sort of and uh, to take another sort of a three level model uh, you know school priorities subject leader priorities teacher priorities and how all those things marry together to ensure that the school is driving forward without overwhelming people I think so just on the subject as well of like archaic structures I think one thing that and I'm sure the school I worked at wasn't the only one that had to deal with this but professional development was a, a, a totally different beast during lockdown when, you know, firstly, because teachers were dealing with lots of other stuff, but also once we returned to schools, there were still restrictions on the ways in which we could meet. And one of the things that we had to put in place on the assumption that we still had school priorities, we still had teachers who wanted to develop, who wanted to learn, was professional development that worked without teachers being in the room. So it meant the recording of videos, for example, that teachers could watch and then do some online collabor collaboration um, in relation to. And there's a big part of me that thinks that it, it's, it's a bit like the working from home debate that's going on at the moment in that there are there is a, a, tendency, a tendency to feel like, oh, yeah, we've got to go back to exactly what we did before when there are definitely certain things that can be learned. There's a lot of value of getting in getting people in the same room for lots of stuff. But some of the feedback that I got about um, professional development videos that teachers could respond to um, in their own time that teachers could 
uh, pause and discuss and ask me questions of relating to kind of halfway through that um, teachers could say to me, I'm actually on a course this week. I can't come to this, but when can I catch up with that? Oh, well, this is a priority more than this, et cetera. So we can make sure that you, that added flexibility that comes with just seeing professional development perhaps as more or with a, or with a wider range of options than we're all in the same room is, yeah. And another way that I think we can consider moving beyond what might be thought of as archaic structures. I think another thing to think about as well um, is I think Matt Swain's talked about it. I don't know if he's talked about it on a podcast or if he just talked about it at a conference, but that whole just, it's an hour a week. So it's one hour after school rather than splitting it in half, which I know they've done at some step schools where they have sort of one that is more kind of theory based. You learn about it, you talk about it and one that you put it into practice with. I think that that structure is far more conducive to teachers learning and beginning to implement things, being given the time to put things into practice rather than just being spoken at for an hour is feels to me far more effective, but I think it would um, take a lot to get that change into most schools. Yeah, along those lines, I felt quite embarrassed about some of the CPD that I've done in the past. After, once I started doing this kind of video stuff, um, over the last couple of years and realized that it just it almost forced me to say okay this week we're learning this next week or in the next professional development session we, we, I'd like you to put this into practice i.e we've been looking at planning or a particular aspect of planning like um, thinking about critical discernments in mathematics I'd like you now to think about what you're going to be planning in maths next week and I start by identifying critical discernments as a jumping off point for your planning discussions that kind of cycle of learn something, practice and reflect, and then give me feedback on what's worked, what hasn't, what we can change, just feels like a, like a whole different ball game to the kind of professional development that I had been doing before that, which even if there was a plan for it, even if it was a little bit longer term, was simply, I'm gonna tell you some stuff, I'd like you to do it in your classrooms, give it a go in the classrooms and let me know. And, and that was, sometimes as good, as good as it got so yeah I think the importance of explicitly saying you're learning something and then we're practicing something and then we're going from there and being flexible um yeah it completely changes how I did certainly changed how I did professional development I mean one thing that really comes across listening to you guys is the need to be strategic and to think long term and Shannon during season four of Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, you talked about your three-year plan for walkthroughs. What would you describe as the principles underpinning sort of your approach to change management over an extended period? And I think that question can go out to everyone, but I don't know if we can start with you, Shannon. So this is something that I spoke about at Research Ed recently, and there are sort of three principles or kind of takeaways that I gave the people that came to my talk. And the first one was you have to get the culture right. Um, so you need to try and build that trust. And that trust does come with time, but you have to try and convince your staff first and foremost that this is not the new kind of thing to beat the teachers with. It's actually going to develop them find some early adopters, some keen people, and that will help you get the buy-in and get the leaders on board because you need them to help with the buy-in as well. And then you've got to lay the foundations. You need to go slowly. You can't rush in all guns blazing. You have to ensure that everyone as much as possible is on the same page as you. So, you know, walkthroughs has been designed for instructional coaching but we knew there was no point in us starting instructional coaching if we didn't have that base level of understanding of what good teaching looked like and that we were speaking the same language. And so we had to let people explore first, which is um, part of that EEF implementation guide. You know, that explore step is really important because then you can prepare, deliver, sustain. And then the third one being you have to you have to do what you can to develop that appetite amongst staff. So you have to make it exciting. You have to kind of show them the possibilities and kind of hint to how far you can push it and how exciting this can be for them and how much you know they could take their development into their own hands. 
and you need to start letting people flirt with the idea of choosing their own path so there might be whole school priorities and there probably always will be and some of you know your teacher development work your professional development will be solving those whole school learning problems but some of it will be individual as well and you want teachers to start being able to identify their own things they need to work on and that kind of being given the the ownership of that should help them kind of get that hunger for it so yeah culture foundations appetites were my principles love that love that wish i'd been able to see your talk really wish i'd been we were on at the same time so that's just how the cookie crumbles but um so yeah i think you've covered a lot of really important stuff there i, th I think part of this as well and I, this has been touched on earlier prioritization working out taking the time to work out what exactly is it that matters most to this school right now in terms of its teaching and learning and of course that's going to be different to every school it doesn't just relate to what the school is struggling with or could improve on it's also what stuff you think is the highest leverage so if the school isn't particularly great at something that doesn't feel quite as important as say formative assessment you go with formative assessment because that's just a you know that's a big deal if you're not getting formative assessment right you can argue that well that's the heart of teaching you can't really be teaching well if formative assessment isn't used well across across the school so prioritization i think alongside that again lloyd touched on this earlier how are you balancing um, and, and you did as well shannon how are you balancing this idea of whole school priorities with individual priorities there are ways to do that a way that explicitly gives time for both of those things through a kind of a routine of moving between those priorities which i think is fantastic a bit of a hobby horse of mine not losing sight of subject knowledge and the links to pedagogical content knowledge that obviously kind of go with that it's I, I, I talk about it a lot secondary the conversation is often secondary led and i don't think that's anyone's fault particularly it's just that there's some really really impressive voices when it comes to professional development that come from the secondary side of um, this conversation. There are some impressive voices on the primary side as well, but sometimes um, we can be, I say we, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not backwards in coming forwards, but I think in some cases there's a sense that we don't feel we can talk for the profession in the same way that secondary teachers can. Anyway, long way round to say, primary schools can for, like have a much bigger deal when it comes to subject knowledge we have to keep make sure that we bear this in mind because we are less likely to be experts in our areas so making sure that that's part of professional development is a big deal ideally embedding room for maneuver between experts in a given area and relative novices and those in between you might deliver some professional development or be about to support some teachers with the professional development where you think actually this teacher and it might be a relatively new teacher it might be someone who's very experienced but you think actually they know this stuff and they know it well enough that i would prefer them to support me with the creation and delivery of this professional development and the support of their peers rather than just be kind of on the, the the learning end of it so there being that room to take advantage of the expertise that's in the school and that bit of flexibility and yeah the other priority would be involving slt if they're not on board if they're not attending if they don't feel that they need to know this stuff as well it sends a really bad message and i think it really undermines what's going on I saw Matthew, Matthew Clark and Sarah Cottingham having a little chat on Twitter the other day. Um, it's off the back of uh, Sam Sims and Sarah Cottingham uh, event they did at the research school in Kent. And in her you know, usual form, Sarah just came up with a one line, which was just stunning. And it just sums up, I think, what you've just said. Change management or approach to change lives and dies depending on the environment. Uh, and, and that's it, isn't it? It lives and dies depending on the environment. And, and if the environment isn't right, so like Shannon said, you can forget it. Like you can do, you can have the most fandangle, beautifully research engaged and, and informed thing. 
I just won't land because they, you know, it's the, the culture is not right. The, 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 yeah, that, that's not right. So how do we do that? How do we move from it into that? Well, you've got to explain why you knew it comes back to why, you know, the, that we, we've said it a million times before on the podcast, explaining why you are doing everything you do in your school. Like, why are we doing this? Because this is what we do. And you, and you outline it and you, you paint that picture for teachers. You focus the lens of change. I would say as you focus the lens of change for the long term, right? Because, Otherwise, it's blurry for teachers. They can't, they don't really know why you're going down that way. You need clarity. So, and, and you have to have, and that's part of getting that environment right, I would say. I would argue that, that a phased approach towards it is probably the best way of doing it. Because again, going back to those, I, that idea of prudence and that idea of, of less is more, because you, you know, you're trying to uh, catch all the, uh, chase all the rabbits, you'll catch none. Uh, and, and, it, and, and that that thinking in, in teaching has not been very fashionable for a long time. There's a legacy of um, get it done yesterday uh, thinking, which I, and I understand where that's come from. It's come from, you know, various stakeholders and various, diff, you know, you, we could, that's a whole nother podcast, <laughs> like for another day, like why that came to be. But, but, it, but it's driven this, this, this culture in schools where, we, you know, it, it's it's ridiculous. Like you can't, you can't, when you step back and look at what you're trying to do and ask, you know, a busy, busy, hardworking teacher to do, you think that's nuts. You know, like that is apps that they're not going to, none of that's going to land. Like, and I, I don't know why it took me so long to realize that. And I, I'm very grateful. Again, I know I've said about my national professional qualification, I talk about them all the time, but I am very grateful for them because that has really sharpened my thinking around that. And I'm, I've, I've sort of gone, what was I even you know when I when I joined Stabilis? What was I doing in that first? <laughs> but like Chris says, the schools are in different positions, different priorities take you know take take precedent, and knowing what they are is really really key. Um, I think one of the last things I'll, I'll mention before we, before we move on is time, time and structure. So like for change to happen, it needs to be given the correct amount of time. It needs like that needs to be protected and that systematic structural protection of that time within the school is absolutely fundamental because if it's not there again it feeds into the environment the environment's not right you know it's it, it, it all kind of into this organic thing you know it will not work if um a super busy subject leader is being asked to do this on a tuesday night when they're absolutely knackered after a day of you know it's not going to happen because they are going to be waning because they they're, they're exhausted rightly so um and because teaching's hard you know and and we need to protect that we really do so yeah um i think yeah the environment explaining the why um having that phased approach it's being strategic and carving out the time and the systems and the structure in your in your school as well yeah i think um more on the culture I think sort of one of the things that I think has been really important for me and talking to the teacher development needs in the schools that we've got in our trust has been putting your money where your mouth is and saying these are the things that are important to us now and dropping other things and so one of my big ones was sort of one-off formal lesson observations that went nowhere didn't impact people's teaching didn't develop them professionally and just were meaningless, let's face it. And several of our schools have dropped them and have gone for the learning walk approach. And we are finding our feet with how that works and how, how that works with appraisal. But that was a really big step for me, I think, to gain the trust and to get that culture right and for the teachers to see that this wasn't an accountability model. Because if, that, if we'd carried on with formal lesson of observations, but being like, but your professional development is important and we're investing in you and we want this continuous thing and it's collaborative, but carried on with that, it, it wouldn't have worked in the way it's worked this year. And I'm not saying it's been perfect, but we've got so many staff on board by making sort of bold moves like that and saying, actually, we don't stand for that. That's not what we're about anymore. So we need to get rid of it. And so I think putting your money where your mouth is early on has been a really big thing for us. I saw, I think it was a Chris Moyes thread where he was talking about the fact that um, in 2022, people are still grading lessons. 
I mean, that must be the most, if it's true, the most ridiculous thing I've heard, because we know how hard it is to actually get an accurate, no, not even accurate, to get an agreement, you know, so I didn't follow the whole thread, but I was having a conversation and I really couldn't believe it. So, you know, if there are still schools who are grading lessons, please stop because you can't. <laughs> I'm going to throw this one to you, Lloyd, first, just so we give Shannon a break from answering the question right off the bat. We can't prioritize everything. What are your professional development priorities? I guess I, without rehashing the last question in sense of like, I don't want to go into the fact like the principles. If I sort of talk about priorities as going back to what we talked about earlier in terms of at the priorities at the different levels i think that might be a use potentially useful way of of unpacking the question this tussle or wrestle between developing the teacher making sure that the middle leader develops their subject making sure that the school develops their whole school priorities based on um the school learning plan or the sip or whatever whatever the name is you you call it it's hard it's really, really hard. And it, it, it keeps me up at night sometimes. <laughs> it's like I'm overthinking about how do we do this the best way? What is the best way of, of doing this properly on the ground, of implementing properly? You know, that implementation is that, isn't it? That, that ultimately, that's what, that's what all of this is. We all want to implement things. And there's loads of things we want to implement. So it's like, how do, how do we decide to implement, for example, a specific teacher development point where we want to make bob really good at cold calling in his class um, across the way or how do i ensure that um gary is is developing the art curriculum so that it's properly linked and sequenced and the teachers understand why it's linked and sequenced um, and then on the top level the whole school priority might be for example um spelling so then how does that then fit in with all those other things so there's all these levels and if we hark back to what i said earlier in terms of prudence and making sure that things are um are being done not being not not being overwhelming i think you know it takes real strategic organization and vision you have to sit down and really sweat this stuff and go right well how do i make sure that that's happening so what we've done, and I suggest this is a potential model of implementation, I'm not saying that this is the way to do it, but I'm going to put my neck out and say, here's a way to do it. Because, you know, we see lots of writing, don't we, in, in curriculum, and we see lots of principles and lots of things, and there's lots of excellent books uh, out there, really, really well-researched books. But sometimes I feel they, they, they might be potentially missing how it's done on the ground. And I think that is really important for teachers and schools to see Here's a model of how you might be able to do this. So this is what we do. We, we, we're looking next year to move to, like Chris mentioned earlier, uh, a model where one week we're looking at a professional development uh, area, which is linked to an overarching strategic vision where we have three priorities for next year. That happens one week, and the next week is coaching. So that is then the, the, the teacher level being developed as well. So that's a uh, whole school priority, teacher's priority, whole school priority. So they're running in tandem every week. Now, the big piece of the puzzle that I'm trying to work out is how we get that middle leadership to be developing as well. And I think what, we, what we're starting to, to consider is, is, is it, again, is it through a lens of implementation? So looking really carefully at like saying, okay, so my French leader, my, my sorry, MFL leader, my music leader, my, you know, they are all working where they're subjects. And it's not to say that they aren't doing anything. I know Nick, Nick uh, spoke in the previous episode about spotlight subjects and about subjects that are waiting in the wings, that are warming up and ready to, to be focused on. But they, they, you know, it's splitting their implementation plans and thinking about, and I know I tweeted about this earlier in the week, about how, what, what are the teacher activities for this? And what are the leader activities for this? Because it can still mean that a, a, that a leader is working hard on curriculum uh, sequencing and uh, materials and um, resourcing. You know, we, we fully resourced our science cupboard, uh, Chris, you know, with but on the back of Chris's superb advice. You know, we, 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 I, my science leader spent months doing that, like, and that was her thing, you know, and it's not to say that they're not uh, they're doing the leadership and get, you know, and, and being 
out doing learning walks all the time and do it because it, it can't happen. It can't, that just can't happen because then we get the knee jerk thing again. Oh, we've seen this. This is not the thing, right? You've got to, you know, I think as leaders, we've got to be able to go, actually, that's not cool at the moment, but okay, right. We're good, but the, the plan's in place to sort it out eventually and trust that I trust that. Um, and, and when I sat down with Ofsted and they came and asked me about this, this is what I said to them. I said, like, look, this is the rationale. This is why we do this. And this is where we're going. And, you know, I think it was okay. So, you know, that, that, you know, they, they, they seem to accept that and say, okay, yeah, you really clearly see what you're doing here, but that having that balance. And now what we're looking at is how those middle leaders map onto a bigger strategic vision over several years of where their implementation sits. So it's like, okay, so here's the teacher, here's the teacher implementation and activities. And it's like, they're going to slightly overrun because sometimes they can. I was talking this morning with my head about sometimes the fact that, you know, we, we're looking at um, uh, LGBTQ plus so it's, it's, it's Pride Month coming up and how that's important. That needs to happen. So we looked at how we ensure we deliver that whilst not overloading teachers with other CPD. Uh, and, and we've worked out a way of doing that potentially in uh, two morning sessions that don't impact in after school. It's, it's having that really like fine tuned eye on mapping that stuff out, carving out curriculum space for it. So we have like a responsive curriculum afternoon on a Thursday where leaders are released who are in the phase of development uh, and go from there. And I'm not going to go on, but that's the sort of like on the ground thing that is happening in terms of priorities. And that's the sort of stuff you have to sweat and it's really hard. And I don't know if, the, if what I've done is even right, but unless you try things and you get feedback and you try things, like Chris said earlier in the way he delivered, delivered that CPD, we're ne you're never gonna get anywhere. You're just gonna be stuck to go back to the first question in our archaic model again. You'll end up slipping back into that and back on the, on the railroad. You know, let's get off, let's get off the tracks, you know? I think um, you saying you don't even know if it's right or if it'll work is madness because it sounds genius and it sounds like you are really putting the thought into it. And I think you may need to talk to some of the head teachers in my trust because I think this time, you know, this time last year, this was like a, a dream for me. And then this year it's happened, but next year it's going to get more serious. And our, our head teachers and our teacher development needs are going to need to think about how they balance these things and how they prioritise. So your model sounds spot on. And I think that the thing is with that curriculum development that goes alongside it, at the moment, what we're having is like we said earlier on week one maths, week two science, week three phonics, whatever it is. And teachers don't have time to breathe. Whereas if you've got this kind of like professional development, coaching, curriculum is running alongside it, but then you spotlight subjects and you know what is being implemented, then teachers are far more likely to respond and implement the things that you're that you're talking about as a subject leader if you've given them the time as leaders rather than saying oh my god I'm still looking at curriculum what are we going to do everyone quickly review your curriculum and you've got a staff meeting in the autumn term about it because teachers aren't going to respond to that and they won't implement all the things they need to implement but you're giving them the time to develop be coached and they've got the time to start implementing and start learning and putting into practice the things that your curriculum leaders will be telling them at appropriate times, not every week, not every half term. It's, it's giving everyone time. You're investing in this long-term development rather than what, for some reason, some leaders think is possible, those quick wins overnight, like those, those silver bullets that are just gonna fix everything. They don't exist. And your long-term thinking, I know you've had Ofsted now, but schools that have got Ofsted looming even, you've had, you had this long-term plan before Ofsted. And I think some leaders are terrified that if they don't have it all together now, like professional development, curriculum development, everything, that Ofsted are, coming, are gonna come and you know, shut them down. But your kind of ballsy, bold, long-term plan has put everyone at ease and your teachers are, I imagine far happier and less stressed than teachers in other schools. So yeah, I, I'm enjoying your, your model and I will be stealing it, thank you. If I may, I'd quite like to come at this question at a slightly different angle because I feel like when it comes to the way I was thinking about answering it, you've covered the bases beautifully, both of you. 
I think a useful thought experiment can be, I want you to imagine that you are in charge of professional development and you've arrived at a school and head teacher has said to you on day one, you know what, everything is wrong. Everything that could possibly be wrong at, a, at this school is wrong. And you go and look around the school and you agree, there's nothing that you think doesn't need changing. Where do you begin? I think that's a really useful conversation to have if you're you know, new to professional development. I think the very first thing is, if everything's wrong, that means behavior is wrong. So your first priority is, can we support teachers with professional development? And this isn't, again, not a quick fix. Can we support teachers to make sure that behavior is set up so children are safe, children can learn? No point really attending to much else until that is where it needs to be. So that's kind of like pri priority number one, because that relates to safeguarding as well as the foundation for learning. If that's then sorted, what's your next priority? Well, it's that generic teaching stuff that applies and has value in every lesson. So are, is, a, is formative assessment going on? Is it systematic? Is it ensuring that teachers are responsive to pupil needs? Is So the other elements of generic teaching. So is, is modeling across the different subjects, the stuff that relates to all subjects, is it good? Is um, our explanations thought through and clear? And, and how is that coming through from planning? So there's that layer of just really decent, solid teaching, which is your kind of your next priority down. I'm biased. I think the next priority down from those, assuming those two are sorted, is what are you doing about reading? Now, you can say, well, reading's more important than the most important thing there is, but it, your reading teaching isn't going to work if those first two things are not in place. So your next priority is, how are you dealing with reading? And I know that's a big thing because you're talking phonics, fluency, you're reading curriculum, et cetera. But how are you teaching reading? Is it working? Below that, again, and again, I might get a bit of a slap from Kira on this one. Below that, I think it's mathematics. I think then it just takes up so much time of our school day that if we're not teaching it well, it's just a bigger deal than if we're not teaching something well that only takes up an hour a week. It's an hour a day, it's a decent chunk of our teaching time. So mathematics, then arguably writing, and then pretty much everything else. And you can then start to say, okay, what are our, what do we want to excel at most quickly as a school? But if in doubt, those, these things, those are the things I think you want to be looking at as like an order of priority. I know that's a very different way to interpret the question than you guys went down, but I think it might be useful to some. Yeah, I think you're right. Having, having spent a lot of time working with new and inexperienced teachers, the map you described, Chris, is the, is the journey that everyone goes through. Behavior, I would, I would change the order a bit. Maybe behavior, explanation, modeling, then the responsiveness. Because I think you need to get the other stuff in place before you can be responsive to something. So I'm 100% with you. I would switch reading and maths because maths is more important. But fundamentally... I, I think I'm surprised you, know, you didn't have maths at the top, my friend. Like, <laughs> who cares about behavior? Mathematics is king, isn't it? Like, literally. Just to know, I totally agree with you about the generic stuff. I was just thinking about kind of generic teaching stuff as, as a layer, and uh, assessment for learning was just the first thing that popped into my mind. But yeah, yeah no, I no, totally, I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I'm just very conscious I haven't really contributed much tonight because of the because of the hair fever. Um, yeah, so I, I'm with you. Um, I mean, that's what I had in mind when I thought of the question. But I loved all three answers, and I think they're really going to be practical sort of for people on the ground. What I loved the most was that it looked like Lloyd was playing a game of mini charades. And I was like, small, small rat on a bike, small rat on a bike. <laughs> so people who are watching back on Spotify will be able to. I <laughs> oh, I'm, just, I'm just looking for a cold drop, Lloyd. <laughs> I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. If we stick with a theme that's going to be helpful to people day in, day out, I, I'm imagining, Shannon, you've got quite a lot of teachers who you're taking on this journey, you know, directly or indirectly. And I know it won't be the same in every school. So we're maybe talking general principles. How do you keep track? of the progress that everyone's making relative to where they started? Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing I'll say is that it's not a walk in the park. 
Uh, you're right, we do have quite a lot of teachers. I wish I knew the exact number, actually. I'm going to have to find that out. But we have 11 schools, nine primary and two secondary uh, of varying sizes. So there are a lot of staff to keep track of. And I think first kind of general principle for a system is roll it out slowly don't go in thinking this is what we're doing this is what uh, monitoring is going to look like this is how we're going to track it this is how we record it because it will inevitably change and if you go in with a list of how it's going to look and then change it three weeks in because you realize that you didn't do it properly people are going to lose faith in you so go in slowly I was talking to uh, Fran Hargrove from the Haringey Education Partnership who is brilliant and we were just saying rolling anything out at scale requires this sort of soft launch approach you, you know a hard launch is going to lose people and you're right the systems in each of our schools are different because the ethos of our trust is very much that schools retain their identity and their autonomy and make decisions that work for them you know walkthroughs is directed I was going to say dictated but that sounds wrong it's not you know it's but it's directed and that teacher develop, a teacher development should be in place but other than that, we've sort of said, find a model that works for you. Now, instructional coaching will be rolled out from September. So there'll be more kind of unification. But even that, when you've got a three form entry, a half form entry, secondaries, it's going to have to look different in every school. So I would say every teaching member of staff needs to be involved. It can't. It can't just be the people that are interested or you know the people that are full-time or the people that are new because even those people who have been teaching for 15 20 years have got things to work on and i i know that some people have said oh, we'll we'll test it out with this group of teachers first and then we'll roll it out bigger but i do think that it's something that if you're going to do then you may as well do it to the whole star but you have to think really carefully about what that's going to look like as for how you track things like their start points and, the, and their progress because this year has been this exploring year and this ex experimenting year, we haven't felt the need to keep copious amounts of notes. Like there's not a lot of paper going on and that is something I want to keep going with next year. There'll be more because of instructional coaching. Um, and some schools will feel the need to have this kind of central log and some schools won't. And I think that's fine, whatever works for your school, whatever makes your teachers feel that they know what's going on. We've had what I think is a really nice system in my school this year, where every week, two members of staff have gone on a learning walk, usually with me, sometimes with someone else um, within leadership. And we've then gone off and filled out a Microsoft form about the learning walk. We don't name names. It's like a general trend thing. So we've broken down the walkthroughs that we work on into kind of little sub points and just said like, where have we, how, how have we seen it in every class, in most classrooms, things like that. Mainly so we've got somewhere we can see what the general trends of the school are because we're all focusing on the same thing. So we've been focusing on live modeling. And then there's a couple of boxes of what good examples did you see that you can talk about the next time we have feedback and what are some common areas that could go into our professional development. And because everyone's been involved, everyone has been far more invested. So I think getting everyone involved, getting everyone out to see other people is really important. And remember that you're not trying to evidence things. So some of our teacher development leads, because of the nature of the system and where it's been so accountability led for so long, have been coming back at me and saying, but, but how do I evidence this? How, how are we monitoring this? What are we monitoring? And it's been very much case of you monitor the implementation of it, you monitor the impact of it, the effect it's having on practice and on outcomes, rather than monitoring or judging the teaching as a whole. You monitor the implementation. So it should involve all staff, it should give teachers a chance to learn from each other, practice in a safe space first before you go into a classroom. My kind of thing is I don't really mind how it's, what the model is, as long as it's having an impact and as long as it's got a few key things the things that i've mentioned and i think um 
was it Harry Fletcher Woods blog recently was like it ain't what you do it's the way you do it and the what was the the model you're using and the way was the the, the mechanisms to change behavior and I think as long as you're thinking about those mechanisms you know what it might be like goal setting or instruction or modeling feedback those sorts of things that are going to change behavior then the model that you choose doesn't really matter because you're putting those mechanisms in place like we're choosing instructional coaching but schools may well keep up a learning walk that's happening every week because it's been so popular and I think that the features that they need to have is that everyone's involved they practice it's the profile of it is is high in school so everyone knows about it everyone's involved in it and just that the, the the ethos behind it is that you just keep improving it's it's not this kind of tick box it's this ongoing thing and it will develop and grow so your system might start as one thing in September and then be completely different by July because we're learning as we go no one in my trust is an expert in instructional coaching we've got Josh Goodrich coming in in June to train up the teacher development leads and a few other key members of staff but we have to find a model that works and working with um like Tom Sherrington and Oliver Caviglioli with this kind of walkthroughs accreditation that I'm doing that's the thing they keep coming back to is that the model has to work for your school so it might be that you do uh, like group coaching and year group teams if you're a three form school it might be that you have got one-on-one -on -one coaching because you've got the staff for it it, it ha you know you have to find a way that works for you but I think that Harry Fletcher Wood blog about mechanisms is the thing to think about so what mechanisms have you got in place that will improve practice I've rambled a bit but hopefully the, hopefully the general feeling was there In terms of um, like keeping track as well of you know what's going on across across the school in terms of professional development, I think a good move is like keep as little as possible, like minimize. If you're deciding like, do we need to keep this much data or this much, which is a bit more minimal, you know. And if that means all you're keeping track of is this is what every teacher's working on at the moment, and that's their own target, and maybe that was the last target that they did as well so that we might want to keep an eye on fine that's it you know in terms of individual tracking as well as and this is what we're working on uh, working on on i should say across the whole school so minimizing it i would say beyond that as well yes you probably want something central some kind of as a school a central record of you know what everyone's working on what you're working on as a school what professional development you've had in place that year and its impact feedback etc so you obviously want something like Google Forms for that. Wherever possible, delegating. You, if you have just one person who's trying to keep track of everything um, on quite a um, detailed level, it's not necessarily going to be manageable over the long term. So yes, you might want something central, but ideally the person who knows what an individual teacher is working on is their coach and them and they keep track of that and there is something nice and simple in place for them to do that so that if you want to know what a teacher's working on you can go to them rather than necessarily having this really detailed central database so if in doubt carry as little information as you possibly can as, as, as minimum the minimal amount that you need and you use uh, google forms or something along those lines where you need to and delegate delegate the responsibility for keeping track of this stuff and make it easy for people to do that. I think this is more of a trust level thing. I, I'm very fortunate in the sense I'm in one school. So I, I'm lucky that I can, uh, I, was, I was talking to my head about this today, like we're lucky about how much uh, kind of autonomy we've got around the staff that we have with us and the our priority setting, for example, you know, like we set it and um, so we plan it, you know, whereas a trust model is different. There's trust priorities, there's school priorities, there's, you know, and different trusts operate differently. Now, I, I can't speak from any experience. I've never worked in trust, but like, I know that must be a challenging thing, Shannon, you know, like in terms of having the different schools to work with and different heads and, you know, that that's not easy. That's not easy at all. So, uh, and like you say, getting the buy-in across the way in a, in a, in a sort of consistent way uh, to, to be able to keep track systematically of what's going on. But again, when you're looking at this, it's like how it, it depends on the level of what, it depends on what level you're doing professional development. 
again, I, you know, it comes back to this, doesn't it? It's like, is this teacher development of like individual things? Is this subject leader development or is this whole school development? You know, and like, they're all difficult that different in different ways. And I think, but yeah, I do think that must be challenging across the trust. And I think, you know, what you're doing is important work, Sean, and bringing that side of central, centralizing all of that and, and giving people, a, a, you know, that, that, that point to come back to within the trust of saying, this is what we do and why we do it. And I think that's, yeah, credit to you for that because it's like, I don't know how I do that because I'm losing sleep over uh, over a school, a single school. So uh, yeah, I, I massive hats off to to that that challenge. And just one last thing, I feel like when you when you opened that, you said it was like uh, it's not exactly like walking through the park. I feel like you missed a trick there. It's a, a, a walk through the park, surely. So anyway, <laughs> I missed that. I'm so sorry. Um, just on what you said about, you know, it being a trust wide project, um, I am so fortunate that every teacher development lead in our 11 schools is really good. I have the best team to work with and we meet sort of termly and I get to go into their schools and we walk around and they know their staff so well. And they know exactly what they need to work on and exactly, you know, how they're doing with the current focus. And I know I know my staff like that too, because we're, you know, we're a one form school and it's really easy for me to get around to everyone. But when you've got, you know, teachers, you know, who don't have any leadership kind of responsibility other than being teacher development lead, and they're a full-time class teacher, but they still know their staff inside and out, it makes my job a hell of a lot easier. So bigging up my team massively because they are fantastic and I'm so I'm so lucky to have that team because I don't think I'd have been able to do it if I didn't have a strong teacher development need in every school the system I devised for myself because I've got maybe you know two form one form and three form at your school the last five years and I don't have the memory to remember what I've done so I might work with someone for six weeks in term one in 2017 and then come back and work with them maybe term three, 2019. I'm definitely, you know, I won't remember what happened in the same year, but definitely remember that period. So what I, I've got like a, a little file that says the date. So each person will have their own, their own word document. Date, what we discussed, what the actions are, maybe what the specific area we're focusing on. Because we, we were always working under the assumption that we were focusing on specific targets, you know, like those mentioned in the teacher care. One of the things that got me a lot of trust from the teachers, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before, is the idea that I would have removed myself from the traditional accountability model. And my notes weren't being fed back anywhere else. Those notes were for me because I could have had, like I said, you know, lots of stuff in my long-term memory, working memory, not so great. So if I work with a teacher at nine, a teacher at 11, and then plan with someone at one, by the time I come to write my notes at six, there's too much it's gone you know so i do think i'm not one for massive centralized note taking but like you said shannon if the mentor and the mentee know the journey well the proof's in the pudding you know school leaders will see oh our teachers are more effective our children are more engaged our children are in receipt of a higher quality of education that's all you need but i do think on a personal level having some sort of really simple system like chris says is really really beneficial because a lot can happen when you're coaching and the school days by, by design, very, very busy. So this one, when I, when I thought of it, it feels a bit like an interview question. I'm going to throw it to you first, Chris. How would you approach resistance to change or a reluctance to engage with that culture of meaningful and often self-guided continuous professional development that Shannon and Lloyd have sort of spoken so eloquently about tonight. How, how would you approach any sort of blockage into sort of, I don't know, forward momentum? Naturally, I think I'm going to have to emphasize certain bits that have already been discussed. I think the idea of emphasizing the why, which Lloyd mentioned earlier, I, I think that 
what can often feel like um, a, a blockage, like someone isn't on board, is often just that you haven't articulated exactly why you are doing something. So I think that's first and foremost has to be there. You talked earlier about developing a culture. I think feedback is hugely important to that. I think when you are leading professional development or you are in some way in charge of professional development, if the teachers involved haven't seen yet that if something isn't working or if something hasn't landed the way you want it to, that you aren't responsive, sorry, that you are responsive to change, if they haven't seen that yet, then it is difficult to trust the kind of the, the process, trust that there's new things on there. I think also, just practically speaking, suggesting to teachers and being honest that if you are trying something, if you're saying, look, I'd like us to, I'd like every teacher to have a go at this first, and then we'll discuss it and we'll see whether it needs adapting. I find, and I remember from my own experience, I find that teachers are much more willing uh, to try something if you say, that's what we're doing. We are giving it a go. We're seeing whether it works. We're going to adapt it as we see fit. If you say off the bat, this is what we're doing now, get on board, it's set in stone, then people are more reluctant to uh, change things. I think also separating change from questions of people's proficiency is a, is, is a big thing. The nature of it is we are talking about improvement. We are talking about, about getting better. But when it comes to the actual individual change itself, if you are describing that as we're not good enough at this and we're going to do this in a better way, I think there's a softer way to deliver that exact same message. If you're telling people, can you have a go at it and then we'll look back and we'll, we'll review it? Absolutely. But if you've still got people who are reluctant, I think asking them why and just saying, what, what, is the, what is the problem you've got with it? Like, where are you coming from so I can understand it? And often I find with these conversations, they can't put their finger on why. They don't, because they don't really get it yet. Maybe like Chris said, we haven't explained it or articulated ourselves properly. Maybe they just, they're just not hundred percent sure. But there's, I, I don't think there's often a, a really kind of precise reason and then I think through that conversation, you can say, right, well, you don't, you know, you don't seem to have one issue with it. You don't seem to have an issue that you can put your, your finger on. So let's try it and, and let's see how it goes. And I think ultimately we want our, te our children to have the best teachers. And so we need our teachers to have the best professional development. And if the teachers can't see that we're doing that and we're doing this for our pupils and for them then I would go in with a hard line and say this is the direction we're going in <laughs> and you need to get on board because this is what we're doing if it gets to that point. Try and find some small wins so that they can attribute their effort to the overall change if they can find some little wins and that can be something as simple as Oh, I was just in uh, Bob's class the other day, and um, and I just we were talking about da 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 da, and we I, I, he mentioned this, and he sort of it's 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 getting Bob to connect with the overall change of what we're trying to do here, and if you can if you can do that, and it's nuanced, and it's it's not this big showcase thing, it's small, it's repeated, it's it's in a way which builds a trust with Bob, so that he's like, I actually he starts to think that was my idea and actually that's my little thing that I was, and then it connects. It starts that, the, that, that fire starts then and then it goes from there. So not a huge thing to add, but I think, you know, just something maybe to consider on the back of the, the really good things that you two have said, really. It sounds like a fascinating talk, Shannon. And it sounds like Lloyd, you've got a fascinating talk in you. So my request is that you apply on time to research it in the near future so that you can we can be there to support you you know because it's going to be a flames talk it's just a shame that we had christopher neil and shannon all on at the same time otherwise we i, I would have missed this talk but thank you very much to adam james for helping me devise the questions in when the, you know in the absence of those from requested from shannon so all I have to do is to say thank you very much 
to everyone who's supporting us on Kofi, to everyone in the Discord, which is really kicking off last Friday and sort of getting kept going since then. Thank you very much, Lloyd. You're very welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Christopher. Always a pleasure. Thanks. And everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening. If you're talking about a cold drop, it has to involve Shannon using the word ballsy, surely. <laughs> Perhaps just over and over. Ballsy, 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 ballsy. ballsy, just ballsy, like, ballsy. Yeah. ballsy.